McDermott. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much. And apart from our, our audience here arguing with the panel from home, of course, you can argue as well using our hashtag BBCQT on Twitter, on Facebook, text 83981. You can push the red button to see what others are saying. And I hope you do that. Now, our first question from Iva Kavalchik, please. Iva. Is a minimum price for a unit of alcohol a sensible idea? This is the idea that it was announced today, the UK Supreme Court says the Scottish Parliament can and the Scottish Parliament will do, which is a minimum price for alcohol. Uh, Emily Thornbury. Our position is that what we worry about is the super strength alcohol, actually, and the really cheap super strength alcohol, which people buy, and, and that's the stuff which is addictive and leads, we think, to, to the worst sorts of antisocial behaviour. So we think that the work needs to be done on that specifically, and that's what our policy is. But are you in favour of what's ha going to happen in Scotland, of, of cider going up in price four or five times? No, what I'm saying is, no. that, is that we want to concentrate on the super strength stuff, on the cheap super strength alcohol. That's, our, that's, that's what we would focus well, on. Well, what is the cheap super strength? Well, there are, there are various types of, uh, of cider and beers and so on that are, that are, that are particularly strong. And as I say, you'll, you'll find you can buy them in supermarkets, you buy them in large, large quantities, and they are the things which people, which, you know, people buy and, and drink in order to get drunk and get drunk fast. OK. Uh, Rod Little, what do you think? I mean, the, the, the news today was that, for instance, a bottle of cider from three fifty nine would go up to £11.20 when yes, this is done. Uh, uh, you in favour of that? No, of course not, uh, because it penalises the poorest people in society, and, and I find that appalling. Uh, and whenever these sort of discussions take place, it is always the poor who get hit by it. Uh, so whenever we talk about what we need to do about obesity, it's put the price up, ban people from eating some stuff. It always affects the poor. You never hear when politicians talk about binge drinking. They don't mean someone having a nice sancerre outside, a, outside one of these places on your river here. You know, they mean, they mean a poor person buying a large bunch of cider because he fancies a drink. Uh, so I'm absolutely opposed to it. We do have a problem with alcohol, but the problem with alcohol is something which needs to be treated with, I think, as much as anything, education. And I think it's as prevalent, and studies suggest that this is true, that it's just as prevalent amongst the middle classes with their bottles of Sancerre and who can afford these price hikes as it is amongst the poorest of us. Don't deprive the poor people of this country of their pleasure, no. Um, Val McDermott, what do you make of it? This is not about depriving poor people of their pleasure. It's about preventing people from killing themselves with excessive quantities of alcohol that they buy incredibly cheaply. <laughs> so it's literally 16p a unit. Hundreds of people are dying in Scotland every year from alcohol. It is one of our biggest social problems. The, the education side of it is important. But that hasn't worked. So let's try something a little bit different and see if we can get a different result. But it does and, hurt uh, the poorest, doesn't it? It is the, the poorest who get hurt. You, you may be right, Val, but it is the poor that that's targeted at. And then also the ones who are being killed by the policy of having really cheap alcohol. Um, and and, and, and on, this, on this point, actually, another thing I would really like to see happen is the monks of Buckfast putting their products <laughs> in plastic <laughs> bottles, because this would ease the burden yes. on the NHS in Scotland immensely from people not being hit over the head with glass bottles of Buckfast on a Saturday night. It's a serious problem. You're laughing, but it actually isn't a joke. This is a major problem. People get drunk on this stuff, which is like a sort of a version of almost like vodka and Red Bull. It's alcohol and caffeine. They get into fights, they become violent, they hit each other over the head with it. Go into a casualty department in Glasgow on a Saturday night, it's full of people being injured by this kind of thing. And the monks won't put it in plastic bottles because the little old ladies in the south of England don't like plastic bottles in their tonic wine. OK, you, sir? Uh, I think they price high cigarettes, which are also killing people, and that hasn't prevented people from smoking. But then the price hike on cigarettes applies to everybody. This is only certain cheap liquor that's going to get the price increase, isn't it? No, I mean, you buy expensive wine, it won't go up. And that's the, the point. That's the point. <laughs> they won't. 
they, they never do this. They won't attack their own drinks. You buy a bottle of champagne, it costs the exactly Champagne will be the same. You know, it's just the stuff that poor people drink. You, sir, what do you think? I think... Me. Yes, you. Uh, I think that the, if, we, if we increase the price of the cheap alcohol, then people will look to illegitimate sources of alcohol. So people will start making it in their back gardens, in their streets, and that will be stronger, less high quality, and then will lead to more deaths. I can't understand why people won't just load up vans of alcohol in England and take them across the border and sell them cheap and black market. They probably will. They great probably will. For great Newcastle, I'm telling you. Yes, or Carlisle. Yes, Newcastle. What do you think, Tim Farron? I mean, I think that the you know, Scottish Parliament has used its, you know, devolved power to make a decision based on evidence. Um, and you may not like the outcome, but I think they're entitled to make it. Uh, I think they've um, attempted to deal with what is a very real problem, as Val sets out. I do it a little bit differently. I think the concern I've got is that, undoubtedly, uh, cheap pricing, um, uh, loss leader of particularly very strong uh, forms of alcohol in, from the retailers, from the supermarkets especially, uh, does do damage. And then you look at the enormous tax burden on pubs which are at the centre of our communities and are absolutely a vital industry to the country as a whole um, and certainly to my part of the world um, in Cumbria. So my view is you should shift the balance of taxation away from the pubs onto the cheap supermarket booze so that you end up dealing with the real source of the problem whilst not taxing and hitting uh, those places where people tend to drink most responsibly. OK. <laughs> no, isn't it so the Scottish government is now using its devolved uh, tax hike. Uh, they've hiked up tax to £400 for those uh, on earning £43,000 um, a year. Um, I worry <coughs> about this in the way Rod Little does, i.e., is it really going to make a difference or is it just uh, adding to the burden who, who, of those who are just managing? Uh, and the other uh, issue you're going to create, which I think, again, I know you touched on it, David, is, is this going to mean... Uh, lots of people from Scotland driving across to Newcastle to load up on, on alcohol, um, you know, spending more on fuel, um, all the other... I mean, well, I, ecological I just, matters. I just, on ecolo uh, ecological matters. I just don't, I just, I, I, I don't think it's a, it's a good intervention, but let's wait and see. Let's see the data beyond it. Is it popular in Scotland, Val, this as a move? Um, I think it is, by and large, yes. I mean, the, the, what I've been seeing on, on television, hearing on the radio, people seem generally to approve of it. The people who are buying this uh, really, really cheap lager and getting completely off their faces, uh, complete cider, rather, they're not the ones who are going into the pub. This is not depriving the poor of the opportunity to go into the pub and have a pint. This is people who are specifically wanting to get off their head as quickly and as cheaply as possible, and that is not healthy. It's not a tax on the poor. It's not a tax. It's not. Well, it is a tax it's, on the poor. No, it's what, a, what it's, it's a tax correct, on people trying but to. But it's still a tax on the poor. Okay, okay. the person over there in the, in the third row from the back, you. Yes. Um, my problem with it is it does nothing to address the root cause. Why yeah. are people yeah. drinking yes. so much? Exactly. There's nothing yeah. about that. Okay. And somebody there with their hand up. Yes, in the, in the centre there. Yes. Um, my concern is for the, um, the generation, like, before myself and before, like, older people. Um, and the, the um, energy drinks are quite cheap at the moment. And obviously, if they're going to keep drinking energy drinks, and then they're going to transfer themselves onto cheap alcohol. OK. This is a, a measure for Scotland. Would anybody like to see it applying... To England, anybody in our audience have a strong view about that? You say yes. Yeah, so I um, I, I disagree with uh, with Roddle that, um, that it's a tax on the poor, and uh, I think if it, if it were applied uh, evenly, not all poor people drink, and um, it, it only applies, as Val says, to the to the cheapest, um, a strong alcohol, um, and I think therefore it would. Um, Reduce the number of reduce the amount of drinks that people buy, and therefore reduce what how much they drink, drink, and therefore reduce the medical and social problems that alcohol then causes. Okay, let's go on to another question now. Uh, this is from Amy Littler, please. Amy Littler. Regarding the Brexit negotiations, would it be better to have a no deal or a detrimental deal? Better no deal rather than a detrimental deal. Uh, you voted in favour of Brexit. What's your view? Um, the no deal option. Amy, is not a good deal. My, I'm on the Foreign Affairs Select Committee and we looked at this particular question 
um, and asked sort of the world experts to come and tell us. And they told us that it would be mutually assured destruction for our economy, would drop by about four percentage points, but also for the EU, the Netherlands, Ireland, even parts of Germany, the automotive sector, for example. So that's a not a good place to be, and that's not what we're negotiating. At the moment, the team, David Davis, the Prime Minister, everyone is committed to trying to get the best deal possible by effectively dealing with the issues that the EU 27 wants, wants us to deal with, so our financial settlement, um, the issue of Ireland and Northern Ireland and the border issue there, and then, of course, of EU citizens living here. Yeah, we, we know the detail, but, but what she's the, saying is, is it better to walk away so, so if I'm, you don't get the deal right. you want? So if you go That's into any negotiation, and I, before becoming a member of parliament, I was a businessman, and I bought businesses all over the world, you can't go into negotiation saying, I will never walk away, I will take any deal you give me, because you will then guarantee a bad deal. <laughs> so you've got to make preparations that you can walk away. Our economy, 82% of our economy is domestic. So I'll be looking forward to the Chancellor next week, saying lots of good things about how we really keep this momentum growing. You know, the employment figures were excellent. <clears throat> this week, you know, lowest unemployment since 1975. But you prepare for the worst outcome, but you, you absolutely try and go for as good a deal as possible by putting forward, you know, the, the best possible option for the other side to mm. then agree to a, to a trade deal that allows us full and unfettered access to the market, for, both for manufacturing, but also for things like technology, which I know a little bit about, but also you know, services. 80% of our economy mm. exports services to Europe, but beyond Europe as well. But the idea behind this question, as I understand it, Amy, what you're saying is, is there a deal so bad that it would be better to walk away from it yeah. rather than accept it? Uh, Emily Thornbury. You see, I've asked this question. I've said, when you're talking about a bad deal, what you're talking about, what is this bad deal that, you're, you, that, that, that we could have? Because we need to have a negotiation here. We need to, we, the public needs to be informed. First of all, we need to be informed about what no deal looks like. And at one stage, the Tories weren't even talking about that. And then when they're saying, you know, no, a bad deal is better than, than whatever it is, no deal is better than a bad deal, what do you mean? What, what does a bad deal look like? Because, you know, I think that no deal means that we crash out, we have no ongoing relationship with our closest allies, with whom we have traded, you know, the large proportion of our, of our trade has gone with the European Union. We will not, the planes will not be able to fly. The, that's not I mean, true, they, they will oh, not, no. they will that's, not. That's already, that's Willie Walsh, Willie Walsh, the head of they, British Airways, has said that is not true. And bees well, will attack us. Well, I, <laughs> well, European regulation, European... Be honest with your audience, Emily. <laughs> European regulation of, of aircraft is one that we're signed up to, and if we leave the European Union with no deal at all, we're not in that, we're not in that deal anymore. You know, it is a serious matter. There are a number of things that where, where we, will, we will have lorry parks on, you know, where we will not be able to export our goods and everything will be gone through. You know, it, it will be an absolute disaster if we have no deal. And the reason that we are being softened up to think that, a, that no deal may happen is because this government is incompetent and cannot negotiate properly with the European mm -hmm. Union. Mm -hmm. And we are being softened up because they will not be able to agree amongst themselves what kind of deal that they want. And it's getting worse. Not only can they not agree what a deal is supposed to look like, there are two deals needed, right? There's the divorce deal and then there's the ongoing relationship with the European Union. So let's just talk about the divorce package. Now we've got legislation before Parliament at the moment and they want, as a complete gimmick, to have a solid date put into legislation whereby we have to have a deal by that date. Okay, and that look, makes, it, and uh, that makes uh, it impossible so that if they come back with some uh, half-baked idea and they put it back before Parliament and they'll say to us, take it or leave it. If you don't uh, agree to this, we're going to have no deal sorry, at all. That just, is uh, no uh, way of proceeding. Uh, uh, we uh, need to be uh, able okay, to, to Emily, have our we get say... The point. We have plenty of time to, to okay. talk with the argument goes on, but just on that particular point, are you saying from Labour's point of view you would like the negotiations to go on not two years, but three, four, five years, as long as it no. takes? No. Well, why are we... you against having it? I mean, are you okay, in favour of... Let me explain. I, no, hang on. Mm. Are you in favour of having the deadline that's going before Parliament that has... Two years from now, it has to be done? I think that we have to have some flexibility. 
I think that we have to be realistic and grown up about this. I first of all don't think that you go. I mean, in any relationship, you know, if I'm having a if I'm having a, a conversation or a row with my other half, I'm not going to go in and try and persuade him that you know I'm right about something by going in and saying. And if you don't agree with me, I'm going to walk out. I mean, this does this isn't the way you do things. But, but you, you know that Article you... 50 says the thing has to be done by the end of March and if, 2019. And if are our... you in favour of sticking with that or you saying? Voted. All right, so let me. So okay, we. You voted we... For it. So we, we voted for Article 50 and we're leaving the European Union. And we have to make sensible decisions and we need to be able to negotiate. And if we find ourselves in a situation whereby we need another two weeks, another month, 26 other countries have agreed to it and the 27th hasn't. And another and that year, needs to be sorted another out. two years. No, no, but what, we, but what we don't want is to have on the face of the bill, to have it in solid legislation, that no matter what happens, there is no flexibility at all. This is exactly the sort of attitude this government has gone into these negotiations with, and that is why they are selling us okay. short. Rod Little. Um, I agree with uh, Emily Thornberry about the utter mind-boggling incompetence of this government. Uh, clearly, to my mind, the worst government that we have had, certainly within my living memory. Um, and the problems... The problems which have mounted up have mounted up because it is ill-disciplined, they keep opening their fat gobs when they shouldn't, they contradict one another and they grandstand. Yeah. And all of that is undermining our negotiations with, with Europe. Yeah. And I just wish you could tell them, shut up, and do as you're told and put the country first instead of your own pathetic political careers. Because what we're seeing at the moment is jockeying for position to replace Theresa May. If you want rid of her, get rid of her. I don't object to that. I don't think anyone would. But be clear, you know? Back to the main issue. Um, I think you're right. I, I, I don't agree with Emily about this. I think. It is ludicrous to go into negotiations with one hand tied behind your back because you cannot say that you will walk away if you don't get the right deal. I think that is just absolute common sense. But your government, Philip Hammond and then Justine Greening, both said that it was inconceivable that you would not have a deal. And you almost said it yourself. So I just do not know where you're going with this. It is, it is an absolute catastrophe. And, you know, I know a lot of people here didn't vote uh, to leave. I did. It was a Close call. These problems are not occasioned by Brexit itself. It's occasioned by a deeply, deeply incompetent government. All right. Tim Farron. Hmm. I'll come to it. A number of people with their hands up. I'll come to you in just a moment. But Tim. Well, I certainly agree with the last bit uh, of what uh, Rod said. I saw a, a very well-respected older Tory backbencher who tweeted the other day that, oh, gosh, it feels like 92 to 97 again. In the Conservative Party. My response to that is it's far worse than oh, that. Yes. Yeah. Far worse oh, than that. Yeah. 92 to 97, yeah. the Tories had Major, Heseltine, and Clark. They had grown ups running the shop. And now you have got a bunch of people concerned only for their own careers, exactly. not for their country, and, and, and not for our children's future. So, um, and, you know, and, you know, M M Michel Barnier, once upon a time, had coffee and croissants for breakfast. Now he has David Davis every flipping day. And, <laughs> I, and, I, and it, so it worries me, because these people are there to negotiate my children's future, yeah. your future. That really bothers me. So whether you avoid leave or remain, you should be appalled at the quality of your team that's out there. Um, bad deal, no deal. Um, I don't think there is a worse deal than no deal. Because if you leave the European Union without a deal, then you've got tariffs of above 50% on British food products going into the single market. You cut yourself off from 50, 50 trade deals that EU, the, e, the EU is part of, another 67 that are being written up at the moment. So how about this? You give me option one, no deal. Option two, bad deal. I'll give you option three. We've got a brilliant deal at the moment. Why do we let the British people have the final say or the final deal? If they want to vote right. stay, then they can. No. Okay. No, no, you've, had, you've had both sides. You've yes, been right. attacked. Well, both, the both Just them, briefly, both I'll come to you. Both was claptrap. Uh, <laughs> because, first of all, you're going to have to have a proper debate about these things. I sat in the chamber, Rod, over the last couple of days of the debate. It's very important that we hear from people like Dominic Grieve because the detail is important. And if that sounds to you like division, it's not. It is about 
making sure we get the legislation right, Rob. But you can't, right. you, but you can't say, on the one hand, it is vital that we go into these negotiations, letting people know that we will walk away if the deal isn't right, and then have your Chancellor of the Exchequer and other government ministers immediately undermine that position and say, no, it doesn't matter, we, th this will never happen. I, and you said it. Yeah. I mean, you have to be clear uh, about well, this. Uh, well, right, let me try and repeat myself. Right. In any negotiation... Don't repeat yourself. Right. <laughs> say something new. I'm going to say something new. <laughs> but, but, but different words. Right. In any negotiation, you've got to also be clear-eyed and realistic. A no deal is not a good outcome. You can say that, but you've got to prepare for it if it's, that is where we end up with our interlocutors on the other side. You can say that, Rod. It, the, the idea that you just sort of pretend it's not there... But, to, to, but to say right. that so it's inconceivable... For it. No, I didn't say that. I said okay. you've got, well, you got, you got to prepare for it. Call a halt for a moment. you go for a good deal, and I think that's right. where we'll end up. Call, call a halt for a moment. Let's hear from our audience. And Val, I'll come to you, because you've been sitting patiently while this has been going on <laughs> around you. Not very patiently. No, not very patiently. I've been sitting anyway. The man up there, the woman up there at the back there. Yes. Um, I can't believe I'm agreeing with a Sun journalist, but um, in terms of the government being incompetent, um, isn't it the case that it's also possibly negligent that the government are continuing um, with the negotiations, having not considered um, the Brexit impact mm. reports that are yeah. currently being redacted, oh, sorry, drafted, um, <laughs> and you know, not waiting and pausing the whole thing until we've looked at what it actually means. So you would put the thing on sectors. hold for, for the moment? I would, yes. And, and over there on the... Yes. Yep. So, uh, just coming back to what Tim Farron said, uh, do the panel see the irony um, that, that some call a second EU referendum, when we actually know what this deal looks like, as undemocratic and against the will of the people? Van <laughs> I'm, I'm not a politician, so like everybody else in this room, I don't have access to the papers that tell me what, what deals are available. I don't know what this government's negotiating because, of course, we haven't been allowed to see the briefing papers. But one thing I do know is that no deal will mean that the only people who will benefit are the lawyers who will spend the next 50 years arguing about this. And I really don't want my taxes spent on lawyers' bills. OK. The, the woman there had her hand up. Which, where was it? No, it hasn't been more. You, sir, then. Can I, can I just say, um, it's really easy to sit by the wayside and criticise when you're not actually at the table yourself. And I get a little bit sick of Labour and the far left just constantly criticising <laughs> what actually is a really difficult decision to make. And, it, and it, it's really easy to, to, to criticise on points when you're not actually under the pressure of being at the table. Going well, then, mate. But can I, can I, can I just, can I just say as well um, that you have got to go into any negotiations with the intention of coming away if you can't meet mutually with an agreement. Emily, well, you do know, you want to answer? It, it's not. It's not hard. It's you know. It's easy to just roll over and have your belly tickled. But at the end of the day, you know, you've got to you know negotiate right. hard. I, 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 I totally no, hold on. Uh, it was addressed to Emily okay. in Labour. Emily Thornbury. We have been clear throughout that when you go... Well, we have to leave the European Union, but we have to bear in mind, first and foremost, that this is about people's jobs. It's about jobs. We have to make sure that as we leave the European Union, we look after our economy, because if this goes badly, people will lose their jobs. And what we have, what we have faced with is a government that will not put that at the forefront of their mind. What they have at the forefront of their mind is trying to keep the Tory party together and their own <laughs> internal fights. And they're putting down all kinds of red lines. We won't do this, we won't do that, we insist on our, our curly bananas, uh, we, we, we insist on leaving the European Court just all this kind of no what you should be doing is we should be negotiating something that will look after our economy and i tell you sir if we walk away from the european union and then we are not able to trade with this big block anymore people will lose their jobs in hundreds of thousands and they will be the youngsters more than anyone else this is serious and, and i do not believe this government have been taking it serious 170 days to go before we triggered article article 50 and i wrote to to the government and i said answer a question a day focus before you trigger article 50 and they wrote back and they said no, we're not going to answer any of the questions. So you voted for Article 50. Because we need... Because the public 
want us to leave the European Union, and we are Democrats first and foremost, and we do as the public have told us. Do, no, do as we, the Tory party told no, you in this No, no, we do as the, as the public have told us, and we, and we leave the European Union, and it is our job as the opposition to try to keep this government honest and try to keep them focused on looking after the economy and people's jobs. You get the you one check. You said right. Right. The, no, the woman, we the woman there on the right. Yes, isn't great. You. We keep hearing this thrown around within Labour, a jobs first Brexit, but there is no such thing as a jobs first Brexit. Even in, the, in just in the North East, so this isn't even nationally, we are set to lose tens if not hundreds of thousands of jobs. But in a five year period, we got £524.4 million from the EU, a lot of which was spent on getting people into work, getting people fit for work and training people up. So that's not a jobs first Brexit if we leave. There is no such thing as a jobs first Brexit. <laughs> And I just say, I mean, the, that is absolutely spot on in, in, in my view. Uh, the gentleman at the front who talked about it being easy to criticise, it really is easy to criticise. And, and the problem is that if I had voted Leave, I would feel that I'd been sold a pup. I would feel that what had happened is that a party, a Conservative Party, in order to try and prevent an age-old split in it over several uh, decades, decided to call for a referendum just to deal with the internal politics, made no preparations whatsoever as to how you might deal with it if you ended up in, an, in a lead situation, and now we are in this mess. I think what I don't want is this continuation of the kind of battle between Leave and Remain. I think people who voted Leave and Remain should be united yeah. in thinking this government has stuffed them. OK, I take a couple more points. You, sir, there, then I'll come to you. Yes. Is it not the case that uh, Labour's Brexit policy just really doesn't stack up? Uh, first of all, they say they want to put a jobs-first Brexit. They want uh, a, such a good deal that they're going to stay in the single market or uh, get an equivalence to the single market in the customs union. And if they don't get that, they're going to carry on talking ad nausea. And if they've talked ad nausea and it still doesn't work out, they're then going to move on and say, well, we might as well just stay. No, no, no. So, no, no. You can't, no, no, the don't, EU... Don't. Okay. No, no, hang on, hang on, okay. hang on. The EU wants us to stay in. If you go in with a position saying that you're not prepared to leave... No. The EU are just going to turn around and say, we'll just give you a bad okay. deal, because that's going to make you so, stay. So, Labour's position is that we, that we have to leave because that was the result of the referendum. And what we have to do is we have to... We have not plumped for... So at what point do wait you leave? Wait a minute, wait a minute. We're not going to represent the 48% or the 52%. We are trying to represent the whole country and we are trying to keep the country together. And so the best way of doing that is, yes, we leave, but we do not need to go very far. We have to look after people's jobs. We have to, we have to bear in mind that, frankly, part of the discussion during the referendum was about such things as migration and changing the rules on migration. If we go to... Well, what we should do is go to our European partners and our friends and say to them, look, this is the situation. Labour didn't want to leave, but the public have decided that this is where we should go. And what we want to do is to find the best way through this. We want to remain close to you, but, frankly, there are some changes we need to make. Not go in and say, we demand this and we demand that. We have... To, that's a nego that's no, how what, you negotiate. What, you haven't All right, answered no, not, the position. Not, I, yes, I have. You haven't. I've answered that we're leaving no. and we're looking after the economy. We do not need to go very far. If they say to you, we're not going to give you a good deal, at what point are you going to say, give us... we are going to walk do you know away, what? we're going to leave? Do you know what? If you don't... Listen, if we didn't stand on the steps of Number 10 Downing Street immediately before the general election and say the Europeans are conspiring against <laughs> us and therefore we need a general election, I mean, there have been lies told by the Tory party and they have wound the situation up in a Younger way which is completely that. irresponsible. But you're not answering and... his point. Well, you're not answering, answering point. my point, yes. Make your point again. My, my, point, my point is, is, is that the EU definitively want us to stay. And if Labour is going to say that it won't leave without a good deal, the EU's position will be, we'll give you a terrible deal. No, no. Then you won't leave. All right. Let's... I'll go to the woman in the one, two, three, fourth row there. Fifth row, yes. The woman in white there, yes. This not going very far isn't going far enough. We voted to leave the European Union and we should be adhering to the vote. I mean, this no deal, to me, is starting to sound quite appealing because it's a hard Brexit and that's what the country voted for. Yeah. Yeah, OK. Yeah. And, and the man, in, the man yeah. just in front of you... The man just in front of you is that you on. The EU currently represents just 15% of the world's economy and it's forecast to go down to 12% by 2030. So are we overvaluing a Brexit deal? So do you agree with the woman behind you? That yes, actually I think a whole uh, uh, just cut, cut Europe's loose. Europe's only worth 15% right. today, and in 2030, right. 
20, it's only going to be worth 12%. OK. Well, thank you. I think, when, do you want to have a brief last very, point? Very, very, you have to have a strategy. And the only party at the moment who's actually got a strategy with bills coming through Parliament is the Conservative Party. <laughs> it, it? It's <laughs> Tim Farron's party. Did Tim Farron's party. Face? Tim Farron's <laughs> party. Um, put out a pamphlet, a leaflet that says, no ifs, no buts, we'll trust the British people. If they vote to leave, we'll leave. Now they want to go back to the British people to see if they can change their mind. Emily Thornberry's had three goes trying to explain the Labour position. Clearly she can't because they're flip-flopping, because John McDonnell says, Nonsense. I will not count as ever leaving, whatever that's deal they give us. What? Right. So that's, that's why right. Emily's all over the place. He's a leaver. All right, well, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, all right. we'll leave it with... We'll leave it there for, the, for this week on Brexit with everybody all over the place, as <laughs> seems to be the And while the politicians fiddle, the country what? bottoms. <laughs> so, just uh, before we go on, uh, about next week, we're in Colchester next week, and the week after that in Scarborough. So, Colchester, then Scarborough, there's the address on the screen if you'd like to come. The next question, though, comes from Andrew Bryson, please. Should children be able to choose their gender? Should children be able to choose their gender? Tim Farron. And this relates to the uh, Church of England's uh, documentation to its schools in this last um, few days. I think the first principle, um, and this is the reason why the Church of England sent this uh, circular out, is to uh, tackle what is undoubtedly the case, and that is um, it's bullying. It is about people being treated in ways which are unequal. And children, I think, in most of our experience, are utterly accepting and capable of being incredibly cruel. And so to be able to give that sort of advice through, uh, through teachers that they should uh, ensure that these issues are properly addressed, I think that is right. I think that is good. Um, an important principle as well, though, is to make sure that you, first of all, do no harm. And it's important that when we look at um, the reality research around uh, gender dysphoria, for example, um, that we follow the evidence and we don't just make things up as we go along. And my concern is that there isn't sufficient evidence out there, sufficient research, to be able to tell us about the impact upon children, about the age at which these decisions can be made. And I am, I am worried a little bit about uh, making things up as we go along on the basis of evidence that is not yet there. What damage do we do uh, to tell, you know, quite young children that gender is not about how you're built, but how you feel. What does that do? And I don't know the answer to that. What was it about the Church should... of England uh, that, drew, that caught your attention and became an issue for you? Uh, about their, 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 yes. their, their edict? Yes. Um, I mean, I think the, the, the clear motivation was to try and tackle bullying, and I think that is right. OK. Um, Dan McDermott. Um, I think that uh, child, children and adolescents want to explore the world. For too long, we've forced people into hiding about their gender and their sexuality. Uh, I think it's entirely reasonable that people should be allowed to express themselves as they feel inside themselves. That's not to say that we rush to the extremes of surgery, for example. And I think that we ought to, to hold back uh, with, with that end of things until people are at the kind of age of consent where they get to do other things that we think young people shouldn't be allowed to do. Right. And, but in, you know, when I, when, I was, when I was little, I was a tomboy, I wanted to climb trees, I wanted to wear jeans, um, and uh, I turned out to be a lesbian. I don't think the two things are connected because gender isn't the same as sexuality. No. But I think if you push people into the idea that if you feel like you want to wear trousers and climb trees, for a few years, then you must be a boy. Mm. That's dangerous as well. Mm. And it pushes people who may be gay into thinking that actually they're not really gay, they're, they're, they're the opposite gender. So I think it's, it's something where we proceed carefully, we listen to what the people, the children themselves have to say, the young people themselves have to say, but we don't push them towards decisions that are irrevocable. OK. <laughs> what do you think? Can I just say... I love the way you've just put that, Belle. Um, so, when I was at school, I, there was a boy in my class and who clearly got terribly bullied, um, who was you know, clearly um, the wrong gender, when I reflect on it, and I look back. Um, and listening, I think, on the BBC uh, Radio 4, there was a programme about a family with a, a young child who was clearly going through 
something very similar. And it is heartbreaking, you know, for a, for, a, for a father of two older boys and a little girl now, this is the toughest thing. But the way you expressed it, i.e. we should be able to speak about things to children, they should be able to explore um, at school so that you cut out the bullying, um, but actually be careful, be very careful until they reach the age of consent before you begin to you know, intervene medically. So what's your answer to should children be able to choose their gender, which is how Andrew Bryson put it? I'll come to you, Andrew, in a moment and see what you think. I would say I, I think we, they should be able to explore, but I think you know, before you intervene medically, you need to get to a place where the parents and the child are sure that's what they want. And I think okay. we, have to, we have to remember that gender is fluid. We don't always find ourselves in the same place throughout our lives. Mm. So, you know, at various points in our life, we may choose to express ourselves as a different gender. Um, and I think that's perfectly reasonable for people to do that. OK. Uh, Rod Little. And I tend to agree as well, though I would maybe... Well, this is becoming very... <laughs> well, a a, a non-debate. Well, well, no, but it's interesting. It's interesting that it is a non-debate because, because without question, the trend within social services and within our schools is to intervene very early on. And social workers have been brought in. Um, uh, the parents have been told that they must see social workers. If, for example, and this happened with a, with a five- and six-year-old girl, a five- and six-year-old boy who, who uh, was spotted by his teacher, I can't remember where it was, and, was, and uh, liked wearing a dress. You know, and the parents were contacted and said, right, we have to, have to go and see a social worker. You know, this, is, this child is, has uh, 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 gender dysphoria. Uh, it's a problem. He's identifying as a woman. This is ludicrous. And I think everyone on this panel knows it's ludicrous, and I would guess that most of the audience does. But it is going ahead a little bit. Things are moving apace, you know, and, the, uh, and I think the Church of England's report was evidence that things are moving apace. I would let kids get on with it and not burden them with this up to the age of, certainly up to the age of 16, and I would argue 18, mm. and certainly mm. no surgery, because that is storing up enormous problems for people in the future who may well come to regret very, very deeply the fact that during puberty they went a bit weird as they would see it. Mm. Emily Thornberry. I very much fear that I've been trying to think of how to express what I think in a way that is better than Valis put it, and I can't. Um, so, I mean, I, but I do, I, I do think that kids should be able to, to wear what they like and behave in whatever way they wish in order to be able to grow up in whatever way they find and to find their own path. And I do remember, I was just thinking about, I don't know if anybody saw the wonderful news reports of uh, some uh, boys who weren't allowed to wear skirts in the summer and who ended up all turning up at school wearing kilts. And they turned up, all of them, wearing kilts at this primary school, <laughs> which I thought was a wonderful way of kind of, you know, of, uh, of, of rebelling and, uh, and good for them. But, you know, I think, I think it's right. I think that we don't... It is quite... It's very important in this day and age not to try to constrain people and to allow kids to, to just to grow up in whatever way they want and to be able to experiment and to be able to, to find their own way. But what, uh, what you, Rod, you were saying, you were implying there was pressure from yeah. social services and teachers. Oh, but there is also, isn't there, pressure from... I mean, the Tavistock Clinic that has a whole in London yeah. that has large number of these uh, children come, often brought by not the teacher, not the social worker, but by, but by the by parents, parents themselves. Sure. Yes, I think they're mistaken as well. I, I still think, you know, though I would prefer the parents to be in charge than, 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 than the school or the social worker, nonetheless, I still think that the children should be left until they are 16 to 18, I would say probably 18, and if they then decide that they wish to realign their gender, do whatever they wish to but do... When you say they should be, be left... Uh, sorry, just I press don't you think on When you say they're left, if a 14-year-old girl says, I now wish to identify as a boy and I want to change my name, you're no. saying nothing should be done about it? Nothing should be done about it. And they shouldn't be... You're saying they shouldn't be... Sorry, they're saying they shouldn't be allowed to... I don't think they should be allowed to. No. To change oh, their no, name. Oh, no, that's silly. That's silly. No, no, I mean, let... let, Why is let it kids silly? Call, let kids call themselves whatever they want. Let them wear whatever they want. <laughs> and if they identify as a boy, then they can identify as a boy. What's the and problem? And what about a boy identifying as a girl? It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. You're, you're happy with that? Yeah, really, I am. Okay. Really, I am. But I I'm do not. agree about, about no final decisions being made until, until so you reach... I'm one with the so feminists running, on so that one, I'm afraid, so. No, but so you're running a school and you have a 14-year-old boy who wants to... 
who says, I want to identify as a girl, and you're well, the you head give, teacher of that school, you'd say, no, no, you're, you you're a boy, you'll be called Paul, and that's it. You can't call well, yourself Pauline. if he is Pauline, called Paul, Martin, and he's a boy, and he's got an XY chromosome, then he's a boy called Paul. So you would be ruthless in that until I mean, they're 18. Really is, that's, that's science, yes, absolutely. And, and until they're yes. 18, you would say yes, that's the rule. Yes, okay. absolutely. The man at the back there. Uh, I think there's two points here. Uh, the first one is there's a severe lack of leadership among our politicians today, especially when we're dealing with the most vulnerable in society, which is our children. Now, a boy is a boy and a girl is a girl, and yet children do have issues when they're growing up. Uh, I grew up in Newcastle here, and there are, I grew up in a variety, with a variety of friends who had different, uh, uh, different appetites, let's say. However, Children need to be protected, not exposed. There's a difference between education and exposing children. And children need leadership. And, and it's very sad today because the panel right here have got no common sense. Children need protection. And when you look at the whole subject of gender, it's, it's gender, uh, it's, it's confusion, that's what it is. Children, when they are searching, they need direction. And unfortunately, we're living in a generation where our leaders haven't got a clue. OK. The woman in the third row here. I recently returned from Toronto um, on, a, on a visit, um, looking at LGBT health. And one of the, one of the um, panellists said about the first thing is to do no harm. There is really huge statistics about young people who commit suicide because of not being allowed to be the gender that they um, define as. And so I think um, the issue is about giving people the opportunity to be the gender they want to be, um, and in a way that's respectful to them, and in a way that's non-discriminatory, non and um, that supports this and, and the age issue, which Rod Little was talking about, 18, is not relevant to that. At 12, at 10... You'd argue the same. I think it, it should be proportionate. So I think um, a six-year-old shouldn't have surgery. Um, um, but there are um, there are times when um, hormone blockers are uh, entirely appropriate. Um, we we can stop um, people having to have um, change it, their physical changes happening, um, and that is uh, that can be proportionate. Okay. And the and the woman in the second row here. <laughs> I just, I just want to make the general point of taking on board everything about gender identification. I've got a, a great niece who absolutely is a boy. That's what she wants to be, and that's how she is. And she's only seven, and her parents are great because they, they, they encourage her in this. They don't contradict her. But from a historical point of view, we seem to be concentrating not so much on the identity of the person, but how they express it as a male or a female. And it's only really, really recently that, that, that men have dressed in a certain way and women have dressed in a certain way. Historically, it, in the past, little boys wore dresses until they were a certain age anyway. Um, men were the peacocks. Men were the ones that wore the most extraordinary costumes mm. and expressed themselves if they were wealthy. I'm not talking about the, you know, the poor old working classes. But what I'm saying is that it's fluid. How we actually see or identify people's gender mm. is not fixed in stone. And I get, uh, just listening to this, it's, there's an element of ignorance as well because that's fluid. And I think we're at a point where... Uh, we can go back to freedom of expression and how right. people dress, no matter uh, what their gender. Valmond, what, what do you say to the woman in the third row there who talked about the Canadian experience? Well, I think that's heading in the right direction, but I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely convinced about intervention at those early stages. I think, um, I think it's difficult. I, I, not, we shouldn't be taking irreversible steps. I think that's the key. Um, we shouldn't be taking irreversible steps till people are of an age where they can make an adult responsible decision, where we would let them make that decision about other medical matters. But where it's an, a reversible choice, then I don't see a problem with that. Okay. Nor should we be dismissive. And the gentleman at the back talks about lack of leadership. If you, I, I promise you, sir, if you listen to the programme on Radio 4 of that child where they are so close to committing suicide because of the way society effectively dismisses, as Rod was doing a minute ago, 
uh, that is either X or Y. It isn't that simple, Rod. I, I'm sorry. I have I'm to sorry, say to sorry, you. Sorry, forgive just, me. I have to say the to you. Science, let me just finish. Let me the just finish. science let is that simple. Let me just finish. Listen, it may be the I'm a scientist, right? Yeah. I, I, I'm so you not, know not, it, not, not, not so a medical know, scientist. So I'm a chemical engineer. But all I would say to you is when you hear a family and their child being torn apart, and that child is so close to suicide, right, I don't think it's right for any of us here who haven't experienced that to be so dismissive about it and to demonstrate, oh, well, we, we know what's best, and that's it. That's wrong. OK. <laughs> we'll go on. Um, let's take a, a question. We'll go on. Sorry to those who still have your hands up. We'll go on to a question from... Um, let's have Joe Williams, please. Joe Williams. Should the Chancellor take John McDonald's advice and borrow billions more to end austerity? OK. Chancellor's got his budget next Wednesday. Question time immediately follows it on the Thursday, so we'll hear a bit more. But Rod Little, should the Chancellor take John McDonald's advice and borrow billions more to end austerity? It's an appalling thing, isn't it, to have to agree with John McDonald? Uh, <laughs> I never thought I'd do that. I don't know about billions more. I certainly think that the government has managed to find money when it needed to find money. Very happily, the government shook the magic money tree and was able to find itself a bung to give to the DUP. So we know that there is money there. <laughs> what I would like to see the government doing, um, and I don't think the government will do it, because it's not the kind of thing conservative governments do very much, um, is invest in, in, um, in uh, industry, in regional infrastructure, and in science, research and development. All things which worried me when we left the EU that we would uh, uh, be remiss about. Uh, I was genuinely worried that that would be one of the things that we would uh, not spend our money on. So I think, in a sense, yes, McDonnell is right. I think we do need the purse strings loosened. Uh, and we need to... One of the big things we need to do, we need somehow to raise the average wages which we're having in this country. Because a big problem at the moment isn't particularly unemployment. It's the fact that people are being paid very, very low wages and therefore can't afford to buy stuff. Right. So both of, both of those issues, yes, I think, I think very important. Yeah. Nadim. So when we took office, the deficit was 156 billion. Um, Look, no, 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 hold on a second. Uh, hang on, on a second. are you being asked whether you'll take right. McDonald's I'm, advice? I'm about to, I'm about to yes tell you. or no So question, the deficit really. is being cut by two-thirds. That is why we're able to have the opportunity to invest in infrastructure now. So one of the things we've already done is to launch a £23 billion productivity fund to get our productivity to where it needs to be. That's what I'd like to see happen. Um, we've been there before with Labour, where they borrow and spend and crash the economy. If you're investing in infrastructure, I think that's a good thing. Um, there is nothing well, moral... to crash the economy? Well, no, there's nothing moral or decent... Can you put that more no, 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 clearly, no. perhaps? No. So we're investing in assets. So we're investing yeah. in infrastructure, digital, transport. That's what you want to invest in. Housing, which the Prime Minister talked about today. There's nothing decent or moral in crashing the economy. Venezuela has the second largest oil reserve in the world after Saudi Arabia. They followed... Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonald model of economic management, they've crashed completely. If you're sick in Venezuela, <laughs> you die because there's yeah. no medicine for you. Well, hang on. Let's, 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 uh, not, let's not move to Venezuela. Let's so, talk so, about so John McDonald's if, advice I, I, over these I, last I, few days I about this budget that's coming. I wouldn't take any advice from John McDonald where he wants to borrow 500 billion and crash the economy again. Oh. I would say because we've cut the deficit by two-thirds, oh. we are able to invest in infrastructure, in increasing our productivity. And one other thing, by the way, the gender pay gap, if we can overcome the gender pay gap so women get paid the same as men, you'd actually increase the GDP of this country four times what it is today, to 8%. If we can do that, that's a fantastic thing. I wouldn't take any lectures from John McDonald about the economy. Uh, uh, Emily Thornberry. So it goes like this. So we've had seven years of austerity and we were told by the Tories that if we could just tighten our belts for a few years, then we would somehow or other, the economy would be better and we would have enough money to be able to invest in public services. Well, that just hasn't happened, has it? You know, at the moment, we are, our public services are on their knees and we are told that we have to continue like this because somehow or other, it's all going to be fine someday in the future. Well, it's not. And what we need to do is we need to have an entirely different way of approaching the economy. You know, this government, in the next five years, is going to cut £76 billion in taxes to the richest and to corporations. 
So don't tell me about austerity. There's a billion pounds for the DUP, but never even mind tax. about that. Emily, how much I didn't interrupt you when you were tax putting your wild suggestions. How much have we lost from the corporation tax? Like 28% down to 19%. We've brought more money into the exchequer. If politicians focus on tax take, not tax rate, then we'll deliver better public service. So... And what we would say is that we are the sixth richest country in the world. A quarter of our nurses need a second job. Many of them have to go to food banks. Half a million children last year went for three days emergency food supplies. It cannot go on this way. We have, so, to, we have to do something about it. So put, and we put, put, will. put numbers to it. And we will. And yeah. I tell you this. Put numbers well, to it. Put okay. numbers to it. Because the so question the, so was, the 76... John McDonnell okay. asked for billions to right. be spent. How so, many? So there's, so there's two things, right? One is day-to-day -day spending. And that £76 billion, pounds, you could spend £4 billion pounds of that, as the chief executive of the NHS has said, in order to stop the 5, billion, 5 million people on the waiting list next year. So spend £4 billion on that. You could spend another £4 billion on lifting the public services wage cap. That would be another good use of the money. And we've still got an awful lot left of the £76 billion pounds that the Tories are cutting in taxes. But right. when it comes to investing in infrastructure, then, yes, we borrow. And we have talked about... £250 billion pounds over, over a 10-year period in order to invest in things like Crossrail for the North, you know, super-fast broadband for everyone, investing in our infrastructure and getting our economy going, because the way we're going, we are just going downhill, and there has to be an alternative vision, and we have it. Okay. <laughs> the, man, the man with the beard there. In the, yes, you, sir, yes. Um... I don't agree that we should borrow more, but what I think they should do is legislate to close the loopholes on the tax as described in the Paradise Papers. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. absolutely. And the person over there uh, on the left-hand side, yes, with the uh, Yeah, it would be nice if instead of sort of concentrating investment in the south in HSs and crossrails, that we could get a bit more in the north and maybe replace our... Uh, what you are going to try and so that work. So, You were, you were drowned out by the applause. You could get more what? Our metro trains are 40 years old and they yeah. just don't work and there's yeah. nothing yeah. to replace yeah. them. And yeah. OK. Yeah. And, and the man on the far right there, you, sir, in the... Right. Um, yes. my, my point basically is this, you know, the, the talk of uh, we need to improve our economy, etc. and this needs infrastructure. What I'd like to know is... When are we going to get some infrastructure investment in our neck of the woods? Yes. Because we're not getting it. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. 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 If, you compare, if you compare the spend per capita in London at over £5,000 in comparison with up here where it's £223. Exactly. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Van yeah. Yeah. The, the price of austerity is not just counted in monetary terms. Yeah. There was a report this week, we're getting 120,000 unnecessary deaths mm. every year in this country as a direct result of the austerity. Now, I think we've also reached a tipping point, in, not just in this country, but worldwide. We, we've reached a point where the wealth gap has become such that the 1% owns more than 50% of the world's wealth. 70% of the working age population of the world. How much of the world's wealth do you think they own? 2.7%. Now, we can't afford the 1% anymore. We cannot afford these people who are sucking the money out of our economies, who are sucking the life out of our countries. We and need you don't pay taxes. And don't pay taxes. All right. Uh, um, I'll... I'll, I'll, I'll there, was the, there was a financial crash, in case some of you missed that. Uh, back in 2008, and yet, in spite of that ultra-high net worth individuals, the number of those has increased five-fold since 2000. Now, you're not getting richer, are you? You don't feel like you're getting richer, but there's a lot of people out there, the 1%, who are getting more and more rich off the backs of the ordinary people, and we need to address that. We need to reform the whole way that we run the tax systems. All right. Tim Farron, we've got... We've got the budget coming up on Thursday. Would the Liberal Democrats like to see John McDonald's prescription adopted 
we'd like to see Vince Cable's prescription adopted. And uh, my view is, is simply this. That, What's you know, wrong we, with the McDonnell one? Uh, well, stock clocks right twice a day. Uh, my, my, my view is that this is the moment. All right, we've seen an interest rate rise, narrow one recently. Nevertheless, we are historically low uh, borrowing rates at the moment. This is the moment to invest £100 billion borrowed in serious projects that will massively create an infrastructure revolution in this country. I don't just say it because the part of the country I am from, but principally in the north, principally outside of the southeast. I see things... I'm, I'm not against HS2, for example, but it is absolutely a southerner's idea of what's good for the north. Yes, you know, if, if, oh, if only we could get to London a little bit quicker, then our lives would be fulfilled. The reality is that it will... It will take longer tonight to get home to South Lakes, to the South Cumbria, than it would if I was going back down to London. And that's an absolute outrage. East-West connectivity is absolutely crucial. The reality is that, you know, the, the elephant in the room, I know we already addressed it, but even the government's figures, the government's figures say we are going to be £50 billion a year short on budget projections if we leave the single market, which, by the way, John McDonnell voted for. And that means we're either going to have to sink into poverty and mediocrity, or we have to fight our way out of it. And the only way to do it is have that kind of Victorian level of ambition that says Britain can be the best if we invest in housing, new garden cities, council housing, green energy, east-west connectivity, the right. best broadband in Europe. That way, we stand a chance. How much of this do you expect next Thursday? Very, oh, very little. Um, okay. Very, very little. The woman there. Lots of talk. Um, yeah, um, I agree with Tim Farrell. I think that the years of austerity haven't worked, um, that, how the Tories said it would, and I think they can at least agree, if not to John McDonald's however many billion, to at least some, you know, investment in infrastructure, because we really need it. OK. And, you know. uh, and you here on the right. I agree with Tim's point that coming from the North East, we've lived through quite a bit of a time where key industries have left the North East, shipbuilding, the chemical works, the steel works, and in the next decade, there's a very real possibility that car manufacturing might leave the region. Um, I think more needs to be done to protect the key industries of the North East. And, and you up there in the striped shirt. In terms of investment for the future, it's a shame that education hasn't got a mention. Um, obviously, this week we've had thousands of head teachers marching on Parliament, mm. asking desperate for money for schools. We've got uh, schools that are only staying afloat thanks to parents' donations okay, yeah. and teachers buying resources for their classes. Okay. And, it, and it, just before we end, because we've had a lot of voices saying it, anybody here against the idea of borrowing billions more? Well, you, you, you've spoken already, sir. Okay. Yes, you in the centre there. Let's just hear a word from you and then we will stop. Um, I'd like to hear an example of a country where Corbyn and McDonald's economic kind of ideas have worked. OK. Uh, you can name one country. You can name one country and then we have to stop. I would suggest that actually the Labour Party is a social democratic party, pretty much from yeah, the centre. The the <laughs> pretty much from the centre of Europe. And if you look at European economic policies throughout, yeah, right. which are successful okay. economies where we where they invest in their infrastructure, where they invest in safety right. nets. Okay, well, we are, yeah. asked the name of a country. Sweden. All right, well, we should have Germany, asked that before. Sweden. Sweden. <laughs> All right. All right, yeah. you, you, should have, you should have spoken up before. <laughs> we have to stop, I'm afraid, because our, our hour is up. Um, now, next Thursday, we've been talking about the budget. Question time is coming from Colchester. We've got Diane Abbott, the Shadow Home Secretary, on the panel, the Business Secretary, Greg Clark will be here, uh, Bernard Hogan Howe, the former police chief, Stuart Rose, the ex-head of m and now of Ocado, and the author, Dre Say mitchell The week after that, we're in Scarborough, and we have Priti Patel, recently in the Cabinet, no longer, Chuka Amuna, and uh, Yanis Varoufakis on the panels. So we've got two crack panels coming up, like this one we've had here. If you want to come to either of those programmes, that's 0800-150-811.